All right, can you see my screen? Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, this is a, a summation, I guess, of almost an eternity in information security, not quite, uh, but it does feel that way sometimes. And I suspect at times it will sound like I am, a, I, I am an old man, you know, a cloud. My apologies, although we do have the same hairstyle at this point. Um, as is customary in these things, uh, there is a disclaimer. Uh, the problem with the disclaimer is I work for my company. Um, it's my company, so I guess my views are my company's views. But uh, there are going to be some generalizations here, so please don't uh, don't hold me to the fire too much on on everything here. It's just you know these are my general views of of things that I've picked up along the way. So this is the the obligatory bio slide. Um, I was born in North London. There's a note there about my accent going astray. So I'm actually in London right now. I live in New York. I have been asked at least twice a day where I'm from. Uh, I was born in North London. I lived in London till I was in my 20s. And then I went to New York in 2001 when I was hired by KPMG. Uh, the interesting things is my, my years of using computers to do more interesting things. I mean, the world was a different place back then, right? I mean, when AOL came out, it was a big deal. Um, my first computer over there was a ZX81, which had 1K of memory, which is probably less memory than this bottle of water actually has. Um, and I think I was lucky in my career, actually. So when I, when I went into uh, the private sector working for CMC, that was the early days of CMC market. So it was a lot of make up everything. It really was my MacGyver job. My first day, I had to make 50 network cables. My second day, I had to deploy a firewall. Uh, the third day, I had to become a DBA for SQL Server. So there was a lot of different stuff there. KPMG put me on the front line of, of dealing with lots of different organizations, seeing you know what their needs were and how to help them. And it really was a baptism of fire in terms of you must make money in this um, because otherwise the people I worked for would, uh, would fire you. So that was good. UBS, I'd moved up the ranks there. So UBS gave me an exposure to the, uh, the politics of, of corporate life, information security especially. Um, so I think that those three jobs gave me a good, a good background. I started my own company in 2010. And then, uh, yeah, my goal is to save the world and get the job done, which is uh, going to come in three years' time, hopefully. So that's enough about me. Um, and really what I want to talk about is, is just provide some stuff that would have been useful if someone had told me 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, it might have saved me some time. It certainly would have helped me to keep my hair because when I started this, I had far more. Uh, yeah, so that's my plan. Uh, I think everyone, at least in operational security, uh, would agree that it does feel like the whack-a-mole game most of the time, like you are constantly responding to incidents, putting out fires, dealing with auditors, compliance requirements, all these things are all being thrown at you all the time. Um, so again, hopefully there's going to be some information imparted here that will make your life easier, maybe. So I guess the first lesson from all this is that security is really complicated, right? And the reason why I, I stress this at the outset is I am, I am constantly running into to people and vendors uh, and everyone else who's going to tell me how they can simplify the security landscape. They have this tool that will save the day. You do this thing, it will work. And none of it ever works. Um, and the problem is, and we'll, we'll touch on this later in a different slide, it's just there are so many different variables at play. There's so much that can impact the security posture of an organization that anyone who tries to say, you know, this one thing will solve the day is just talking out of their butt, really. Um, and because it's complicated, I think it's very hard for people who are in the field to really feel like they're achieving something a lot of the time. I think that there is there's so much to learn here. There's, you know, when I first started, there was just breaking stuff, right? So you would do some reverse engineering, you do some network work. That was about it. Application security really didn't hit the sort of mainstream until sort of like 
the late nineties, I guess. And then the cowboy hat books came out and suddenly everyone was on security applications, security. And then that's grown and grown as applications have become like the mainstay of the world. Right. Um, but that's a massive area to deal with. Right. I mean, there are so many different application stacks out there. The cloud has come along, which has made this more complicated as well. So it's really tricky. And I think if you embrace that, it's tricky. You, you, you might not lose your mind so fast. Uh, the second slide here, lesson two, right? So mostly useless things. This is where I have the unfortunate habit of starting to get myself into trouble, right? Um, there are things that we have to do, that you're going to have to do, that you do do, um, that you probably think are useless. Um, and if you don't think they're useless, uh, they may be useless. Um, but we have to do them, right? Um, antivirus is always easy to beat up on, right? Um, it, it doesn't really do that much these days, to be honest. I mean, it does. I mean, there are endpoint solutions which now do some more interesting things. But for a long time, we had to install antivirus everywhere because that was the requirement. Uh, security awareness training, I have a particular beef with because it's pushed out all the time. I, I don't think it works. I've seen it fail. Uh, more times than I've seen it work. I think that the, the underlying reason for that is that security awareness tries to teach you sort of logically what you should do to stay safe, right? So don't click on a fish, don't do this. Whereas the stuff that's attacking you, social engineering attacks, that kind of stuff, is really going after those more base emotions, right? So love, greed, that kind of stuff. That's what you're targeting. So having a sort of pretty poster and a mouse mat and a slideshow you have to go through, is just not gonna compete with thousands of years of human evolution. Um, we, have, we have done various assessments where we've broken into places simpler, simply by making sure that we blend in, um, which really at that point was about wearing a camouflage baseball cap, which is the legendary story as told by Davin Bateman. I'm sure at some OWASP meeting somewhere. Um, vendor reviews, I mean, it's always kind of a window dressing assessment there, right? You'll look at the certs they have, you'll send them a questionnaire, they'll reply, everyone does this dance. And still they all get hacked and we lose our data and everyone sort of sits around going, what happened there? Um, the problem is as well, because those vendors, their environments are complicated as well. So they're not static either. So there's constant change there. Black box testing, uh, I, was a, I was a penetration tester by trade back in the day. We used to do a lot of black box testing. You would basically just be told, go and test this client somewhere, find them, break it. The problem is firstly that, well, not firstly, the problem is it's a waste of money to do that, right? For the most part. So if you are someone who is a buyer of penetration testing or any kind of assessment that could involve black box testing, I think if you pay someone to go and find your IP addresses, you're just wasting time because whoever's targeting you is going to find your IP addresses, right? They're going to find where your application is. Um, so just give the people during the testing, this is what I need you to do as the target. You'll, you'll have a much more effective use of the resources you've allocated to do in that test. Compliance is this thing again that we, that we have to do. Um, compliance is good in some instances for setting a baseline. Uh, I think though that there are lots of organizations that just rely on compliance for their security posture and it, and it never works. I mean, the simple reason why is if there is a checklist that you're using to, to, to build out your security program, the people attacking you can download that checklist as well. Uh, and I believe T-Mobile was PCI compliant. So anyway, um, I'm reviewing threat intel. Threat intel is this other area that we, um, we have this sort of love hate thing with. Uh, it tends to create a lot of noise. Most people I talk to about it, it's, it's very non-specific. It really doesn't get into the weeds and, and give you the information you know to take action. It will just sort of be, there is some ransomware, it attacks windows. Cool. Um, I'm not sure if you're really gonna, you know, spin up a lot of a lot of resources to deal with that, right? So threat intel right now, in my opinion, is this sort of vague notion that just gives you a lot of data, a lot of noise, but there's not really useful intelligence that you can act upon in there. 
But nonetheless, we have to do most of these things, right? And I mean, a lot of it is done um, as a CYA exercise, I think, uh, which is okay, right? You need to have done those reviews to make sure that if that vendor does get compromised, you've done your due diligence to a certain extent. So you can say, yes, we did this. You need to meet compliance requirements because a lot of those are regulatory and so on. So we can't escape these things. Um, but I would raise question marks over their effectiveness. Uh, the next lesson I think is really important actually is auditors are not evil, right? So anyone who is in any position where you've dealt with, with auditors, at some point you probably wanted to throw something at them. Um, and I think that a lot of this is due to this antagonistic relationship that develops between auditors and information security people. But there's a flip side, right? If you can do this the right way, audit will actually help you get stuff done. So if you can get audit to agree with you on this new WizBank security project you need to do, audit typically has the clout to sort of go to the board of your organization and say, we should do this. And it tends to be done, right? It's like magic. It happens. Though. It happens all the time. I've seen it happen all the time. Um, I'm sure there are some people who dispute that, but it really does. Also, your boss will be very happy if you work well with audit. Um, and you might even get a promotion. It's cool. If you work against them, what will invariably happen is um, you'll create problems. And unless you can justify the reason for those problems, you'll probably lose your job at some point, right? Um, one, one caveat to this though, right? Sometimes auditors do ask ridiculous things. Uh, there was an auditor that I had to deal with once who insisted that we have 100% patch deployment and 100% AV signature deployment within two weeks of a patch or an AV update being released. This was across 240,000 systems spread across 63 countries with a lot of people who just didn't switch on their laptops for a while because they were off doing business development work. Um, that came to a head. There was some interesting cursing that occurred on a phone call. And uh, ultimately it was agreed that we didn't actually need to meet this ridiculously unobtainable target. So there are some exceptions, but really if you can work with audit, you, you, you might have a happier life. Uh, one for the penetration testers, right? Don't just rely on tools. Um, tools have kind of become the be all and end all of so many penetration test projects these days. Um, the problem is that I think that, you know, firstly, there are, there are a variety of problems that they can lead to, right? So um, they can cause outages, right? You can't scan everything with Nessus. You can't scan everything with NMAP, right? If you're doing an assessment, right? Um, Certain things are delicate and will break. Printers and NMAP are a legendary issue. Nessus and many things is an issue. Um, AIX stacks used to fall over with, 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 with NMAP scanning. Um, application security tools often fire, you know, have, have been known to create so many emails on the back end that the marketing person comes in on Monday and screams for blood, right? Um, so you can't always just fire the tool at everything. They do create a false sense of security, right? Um, vulnerability scanning is not penetration testing. If you're doing development work, you know, running a quick scan probably isn't going to be as good as a decent code review. Um, so it, it can lead you into this trap where you believe, hey, we're safe because we ran a scan or, hey, we found no issues. This client's cool. Um, also, you'll probably end up being out of a job is all you, if all you do is run tools, right? Because you can automate those, right? Um, if you can press, you know, click on a tool, a machine can be told to press click on a tool. I think what's really useful and I think what actually has, has worked for a lot of the really good penetration testers that I know and have known is, is, is to understand the fundamentals, right? Understand how TCP IP really works, right? Understand how networks really work, how operating systems work, you know? Learn to do some programming, right? Make sure that you can code in something, right? Um, really, if, if, if you understand how, how these, these infrastructures, architectures work, you'll be in a much better place to then say, okay, I need a tool that does this thing go and search for it, 
or just make your own tool or just do a manual test for the thing you want, right? Um, so really go back to the fundamentals of like, how does this stuff really work, right? Also, I think it's good if you roll your own security distro. I have nothing against distros, right? Kali, you know, Black Arch and so on. It's all good stuff. Um, but sort of like, they tend to just lead to people firing off every single tool they can in their distro against the target, not knowing what all the tools actually do. So the actual effectiveness of, of that is minimal, right? Um, so install box that, you know, install Slackware, right? And then just deploy to it the tools you want that you find you need, right? Um, you'll learn much more, you'll achieve much more, and uh, you'll, you'll be a better penetration tester. Trust me on that one. Um, and yeah, manual testing is cool, right? You know, it's sometimes you do have to do manual testing against these things, right? There's not a tool that's going to solve all your problems. For instance, right now we're, we're doing work against IPv6 environments, um, remote host identification on IPv6 is really tricky. Um, so yeah, there's no tool that just pops up and does that as far as we know, but we are working on something. Lesson five, right? Don't underestimate the bad guys. Um, I read an article a few weeks ago now that said bad guys are just like everyone else, which is true to a certain point, right? Of course they are, right? Um, the fundamental difference and problem that, that we always seem to face in security is depicted by that chart, right? Uh, bad guys make money by breaking into your environment, by coming up with new ways to break stuff. Uh, the good guys typically have to not spend any money on security, right? Uh, you will read articles everywhere that tell you how security expenditure continues to rise. That does not apply uniformly as far as I know. There are some sectors where there is a lot of expenditure increase. Um, it tends to be the ones that did very well in the last 12 months. Lots of organizations though, are still trying to save money, right? So if my profit motivation requires me to break you, I'm going to spend more on security, on breaking security, and you're gonna keep spending less and less because you wanna save money. Um, also, bad guys do really cool stuff, right? So we were having a, well, we were doing some work and we came across an instance, an interesting occurrence where a bad guy had submitted a vulnerability that had a CVE assigned to it. And the reason this was being done was to fix something in the code so that the other exploit they actually had would work better, right? That's, that's original outside the box thinking, I think. Um, so using the CVE system against itself to help you exploit something further along the line. That happens a lot, right? Again, because these people are working to, to break the things that we're building, right? Because that's what their, that's how their business operates. So I think you underestimate them at your peril. Um, I think that if more security people could really spend a few minutes thinking actually like a bad guy, um, rather than just, you know, well, I went on this course and I read this book and da, 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 and this is what they do. Um, because there's so many different ways to attack a target. Um, that you really have to try and say to yourself, you know, how would I do this if I had no holds barred, right? I was talking to someone earlier and it kind of came down to the easiest way for me to get a password really would be to put you in the trunk of a car and hit you with a crowbar, right? Can't really do that, right? But, well, I could. But if I really wanted to breach an organization, that would work, right? But you would never do that during an assessment, right? And rightfully so, because bashing the CFO with a crowbar would be a bad thing. Um, but yeah, just, just don't underestimate them. So next, right? One size never fits all, right? Um, so every organization really is a beautiful and unique snowflake, um, contrary to sort of, you know, paraphrasing Tyler Durden there, right? Um, and the reason is for all those things listed in that yellow box, which I'm not going to just read out, um, all those things and more create your environment and your environment is different than the other environment and what we see a lot of times is someone will succeed in an environment and they have what they call a playbook and i hate doing air quotes but a playbook and they will take that somewhere and they will deploy it 
and uh, it won't work, right? And it won't work because they haven't taken into account that this new organization is different than where they were. Um, if you take a really simple organization, right? If you have 10 employees and 10 workstations and they've each got different applications configured on them and they're using different cloud services and there's, you know, and they're a financial services startup, right? They're gonna have a different structure than a 10 person manufacturing company that's producing some sort of new widget, right? Different applications, different people, all these things, right? And then you bake in the outside world, right? The economic environment, what countries you operate in. If you operate in Europe, you probably have a different threat profile than if you operate in South America, right? You're concerned with different things, different regulatory requirements. All this is coming into play, right? So if you go in saying, hey, I really kicked ass in my last job because I did this great thing, I'm just going to go do it over here. You're not going to win, right? It's probably not going to work, right? No matter how good you are. Um, so I think that you really do have to take into account that every organization is different. Um, and that's okay, right? Going back to it being complicated, it's okay that everyone's different and you have to tweak things around. The sort of core things are still going to stay the same, right? Like right now you're going to do, you know, secure development, you're going to do vulnerability management, you're going to have network security controls, you probably have a monitoring system. Those things are going to be the same, but how it bubbles up is going to be different, right? Everyone else doesn't suck, right? Um, this is this is something that um, I guess I was part of for a long time, actually, and I suspect sometimes I still fall into, right? Um, information security people especially have a habit of saying everyone else who doesn't know what they know sucks, right? Um, and it's just, I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? Um, I think that if you if you judge someone because they don't know how to do the specific thing you do you are you are missing an opportunity there right all those quotes i mean for the most part are are real right um the star wars one is one that we use at work a lot actually which is kind of an outside one but if you think of the red team one right i mean red team is this wonderful jargon now that just means different things to different people right um, and people will argue that their version is correct and your version is wrong. It's physical, cyber, social, blended operations. It's APT simulation. It's whatever it is, right? All those things have been posited to me as red teaming, right? And then people will dismiss the person who gave them the other definition because their definition is not the one they read in the book or they saw a tweet or something like that, right? Um, it, it's kind of crazy. It's pointless. Um, I think that if you if you can accept that everyone does probably know something useful, you will you will have a much better time. Um, I was talking to our secure um, our senior dev the other day, and uh, he said one of the good things that he liked about working with us uh, was that we're not just constantly saying to him, "This is how you should do this thing." Right? It was more like, "How would you do it? What could you do?" Right? Um, we all have our ideas on, on what is the best way to do something, what you should know, what you don't have to know. Um, and usually it's partially right. Um, I'm extremely lucky. I get to work with a lot of smart, different people who come together in a way that um, I, I don't think would pass a lot of corporate screenings. I think that uh, we have this really unique talented collection of misfits right and i think that that's what you need to cultivate right you need different people bringing in different ideas right um i have seen project managers uh, do fantastic social engineering work because they're just like this is what i'm gonna go do right um i have seen penetration testers you know have really great ideas on things that have nothing to do with penetration testing right i've seen people who aren't even in information security give you really great ideas so, so try not to believe that you are the best in the world at this, um, because you're probably not. Um, and uh, if you can write a useful program in more world, that'd be really cool, but it's really hard. So good luck if you can though. Um, so the next one, I think, you, you know, I'm trying to get through this because I'm wary, I'm, I'm aware of the time. Um, so the first sort of unfortunate truth, I think, in the last three slides are sort of like the big slides. Um, 
security information security right now really is it's just a, it's just a, it's very much driven by money right um across the whole board right um and i think in my in my sort of synopsis for this i talked about like the endless hype and bandwagon right so 20 years ago information security was this minor blip on the it landscape right i mean we've kind of done it i was lucky and i got into it early um but it was nowhere near the the juggernaut that it is now right and it's it's a good thing in a way that it has this support it's good that we have so many great people out there doing really interesting stuff and starting companies and doing projects and making stuff open source and all these great things right but what's also pushing it is this endless quest to like you know for more and more cash to be made right right and the problem is it's just it's really weird right it's created this really interesting odd space and to be honest before I really started running my own company, I really had no idea of quite how crazy it was, right? So if you talk about pay to play, uh, there was a project once, a long time ago now, uh, where we had this really interesting piece of actual freight intelligence, targeted freight intelligence against specific members of an industry. Um, so we went to a intelligence sharing group and said, hey, we want to give you this data that you can share with your folks, right? You don't even need to, you don't even need to say it's from us. And I remember having a phone call and being told if I paid $50,000, I could speak at a conference and share this fairy tale. And I remember sort of saying, well, wait, your, your objective is to disseminate useful information to your members, right? So I'm trying to give you this stuff for free. Uh, yeah, but if you pay us 50 grand, then you can talk about it. And that happens time and time again. Like I used to think that if you submitted a talk to a conference and it was good, you would be picked up and have a talk and it'd be cool. That's not really what it works a lot of the time, right? A lot of the time it really is paid to play, right? I know because I paid to talk at conferences now. Um, and it's just kind of, you know, so, so that is what's driving a lot of this. There is a massive investment industry in information security, right? Um, there was an interesting article in, in, on uh, the VentureBeat website two weeks ago now that someone sent to me, um, which was basically InfoSec is on fire and uh, venture capitalists don't care, right? And the way it's kind of playing out is there's money being pumped into Series A rounds just to get to the Series B round, so you get bought out and then so on and so forth. Um, I knew of a company once that got $5 million of funding because uh, they wrote a really nice PDF on what they were going to build and that was it. Um, and they didn't have any other experience, but they had a good connection and they just got money and then they grew and grew and grew and then they collapsed, right? Um, so money really is driving a lot of the good we see in security, but it's, it's driving a lot of the bad. And this is, I guess, where I sound a bit like an old man yelling at clouds, right? Um, but typically as well, you know, what happens is a company will, will start, will do interesting things, will grow and grow and grow, and then it will either get acquired or it will, it will have an IPO or something like that, right? And then what, what happens nine times out of 10 is the quality of the product will drop, company will become stagnant, and then it will just try and re-energize somewhere along the way, right? Um, and the hype around this is crazy, right? Like there really isn't any AI in cybersecurity that actually does anything useful. Sorry, sorry to put that out there, but it's true, right? Um, there's a lot of statistics at scale, but there's not a lot else, right? Um, so I think that if you can sort of work out the good from the bad in that, that will certainly help you navigate what's going on. And if you have a cool idea, and you, and, and you get funding, fantastic, make it work, get it done, right? That would be cool. Um, so that's that one. The second unfortunate truth, right, that I really have come to, uh, to learn from doing this um, is really just, you know, is depicted there, right? Um, you don't have to be the most secure company, right? You just have to be more secure than your competitor, right? Um, unless there is a specific targeting of your organization, 
this other person is going to get hacked, right? They're going to get breached, not you, because they're the easier target, right? If I am looking to steal information on widgets, um, I will I will go after the easiest target, which again is what happens across most facets of, of human existence, right? We tend to take the easiest road, right? Um, and I think that what we're seeing is we're seeing this process actually accelerate now. So if you look at different industries, if you're in financial services, you're one of the fastest runners right now, probably, right? And if you're in big tech, if you're in industrial healthcare education, you're maybe not the fastest runner, right? So if you're in those industries, you, you face this problem where you are an easier target, right? So you have to do things smarter and better and take account of everything else that we've been discussing, right? Um, because you're probably not gonna catch up to those fastest running industries anytime soon. And if we go back to the previous slide as well, it looks for, from, from a lot of places like this fragmentation is only going to increase, right? So the companies that spend the most will be the fastest for the foreseeable future um, because they can buy every tool under the sun and they can hire good people, right? I mean, information security salaries are ridiculous. Uh, take it from me as someone who talks to people about their salary requirements, right? Um, because there's a shortage, right? So there are, there are moves being made to, to create educational programs to bring about, you know, a, a broader number of folks in InfoSec, right? But that's going to take a while, right? Um, so yeah, it's just, you know, this is something that we're going to have to deal with for a while. And the final major lesson, right? And this is the most important thing of all. And this was also discussed in Anastasia's slide as well. She mentioned about business risk. Um, if you can speak business, um, you'll win at whatever it is you're trying to do, or at least you have a better chance, right? Um, if you can explain the information security risk, the issue, the finding, the project, whatever you're trying to do, if you can explain it in a way that the the business person, which really is anyone who's not in InfoSec or in IT, right? If you can explain to them in a way they understand, you have a better chance of success. And you may think that that's not true, um, but it absolutely is true, right? So I remember, for instance, being in a meeting um, where there were two proposals being made. Um, someone wanted $10 million to create a new investor media center. And then there was a request for $200,000 for vulnerability scanning stuff, right? Which was a good discount, actually. The $10 million investor pitch was approved in about four minutes. Um, the vulnerability management pitch had to go through three iterations, two different CISOs before it finally got approved. Um, and we see this again and again, right? People don't put what they're trying to do in the language that the person they're talking to understands, right? If you find a vulnerability in an assessment that you think someone should fix, if you just say, if you execute this, you know, exploit, if, if you exploit this vulnerability, you'll breach this system and uh, you can be the main admin. Most people who are outside tech are just gonna be like, whatever, right? What does this really mean? If you say, and you can destroy this business process, that's a far more, you know, obvious thing that someone understands to fix, right? Um, and context is everywhere. I was talking to a CISO once um, in a, of a Las Vegas casino who mentioned that there was this penetration test that was done. You know, the pen testers did this really great thing where they, they, they were explaining how they were going to mess with the firmware of a slot machine. So if you put in a coin and press the button, it would pay out. And they thought this was the best attack ever. Um, and they got laughed at because it was like, well, you haven't taken into account the context of this environment, right? Firstly, if you get the jackpot on one slot machine, okay, so what, right? That's not really going to make a big deal in the scheme of things. Um, and secondly, you're going to be found out because you haven't considered how the environment really works, right? Lights normally go off, there's noise, there's all kinds of things when you win a jackpot, right? The machine just doesn't spell the money, right? 
Um, so I think that the more you apply context to what you're doing, the more you understand business, um, the more likely you will be to succeed, right? And I think, and I think you know, for, for my own career in information security, right? Um, I think that that's probably been the best weapon or best resource that I've had, right? Is the ability to say, do this because this is how it impacts your business. This is how it will save you money. It's probably not going to make you money. There's not a lot of security things you'll do that will actually make someone money, but you can certainly save the money, illustrate dollars and cents, pounds and pence. This is how this is going to work, right? So really do try and you know understand this. And to do this, really, you're going to have to just go and talk to business people, find out what your organization does. What does it really do to make money? Um, whenever we do an assessment, right? Whenever I've talked to people about assessments, so of the, the first question, maybe the second question is, what's your worst day as an organization that could be realized by a cyber attack, right? Um, you know, which is you really explained to me how someone could trash you via, via a hack, and that's what I need to focus on. There's no point in me trying to hack some random box if I can't get anywhere in your network and achieve that objective. So yeah, really keep that in mind. Um, a bonus lesson is just, yeah, um, certifications are really good, especially when you're looking for a job, absolutely get a certification, right? Especially in this day and age, because it will get you through that initial HR screening. Um, I've, I've just learned to be wary of anyone who has lots of certifications, um, because the question invariably comes up like, you know, when have they actually done any work? Are they just studying for exams all the time? Um, so certainly do a cert here or there. Certainly do a cert. It's terrible English, actually. Um, but yeah, just, just be cautious of someone who has lots of them. That's a bonus lesson. Um, and finally, yeah, I mean, I realize this is a bit of a sort of self-help slide. Um, but do try and be yourself in this, right? Um, everyone has commitments, right? Um, I put buy cat food in there. I don't even have a cat. But everyone keeps talking to me about cats for the last year. So I believe they are quite popular now, um, more popular than they've ever been. Um, and, you know, I've had discussions with, with, with people who are still in the weeds of InfoSec where they have talked about, you know, am I selling out? Is this, am I doing the right thing? I feel a bit skeezy doing this, right? Um, and I think it comes down to sort of like a personal choice, right? Um, you don't need to do that. You can sort of push out, you know, this is what I believe. This is what I think. Um, feedback from across the board now um, is that there is this kind of information security fatigue that's set in um, with everyone who's not in the information security industry. Um, and the reason is that, again, you know, we're 10 years, 20 years in, and the same crap keeps happening, right? We still keep having the same issues, right? And you can argue about, you know, it's a very, it's it's in its infancy, it's it's immature and all this stuff. It doesn't matter to to the end user though, right? Or the person on the other side of the table, right? Um, it's no good to sit there in front of some organization that you just lost its its IP and say, well, you know, the industry is in its infancy, so you have to expect this because they're just going to be really annoyed, right? Um, so people are starting to really request, require, and really um, respond well to just honest feedback, right? Honest answers, right? Um, tell me what's going to work and what's not going to work. And if, and if nothing's going to work, then tell me, right? Um, you can't push back on some of those things, right? You're going to have to do compliance. You're going to have to deal with all those other things that we discuss, right? Um, but I think that if more people do sort of stick to their guns and you, you do have those conversations with, with your customers, whether you're a consultant or an operational security person or a dev or whoever, right? And say, this is the way to do this. And if you put it in that right context, I think you can probably maybe sleep a bit better if, if that's your thing. And if not, you can play politics. That's cool. And everyone, you know, I'm sure you'll succeed and have a nice day. Um, but you know, I think that, that there is the potential and it is growing and there is a demand for people just to actually, you know, do this in an honest way now. Um, and that's what I believe is, a, is gaining traction. So 
I think that that's it. Um, I'd like to thank OWASP London for letting me talk. Um, again, it's uh, I am from here, so it's actually quite nice to come here and talk. Uh, I will now return to New York and my accent will get more confused. Um, but yeah, thank you all. I hope this was useful. Um, yeah, it's cool. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, excellent. Fantastic. Thank you very much for a great talk, Mark. Um, I uh, certainly learned a lot and uh, uh, in your 10 questions to be asked, some very, very interesting points you discussed there. Uh, there are a few questions um, uh, from the audience. So um, question number one, what would you say to the CEO of a company who believes that they are too small to be hacked? Um, I guess my conversation with them would be, um, you know, what's your worst day, right? I mean, is there something you do where an attack could actually harm you? Because some organizations, you know, when you really do the whole threat profile thing, some organizations aren't probably going to be hacked, right? Um, because it is a numbers game as well, right? So I think that if you, if you have a conversation and say, okay, what do we do as a business? How do we make money or how do we get funding or how do we get whatever? Is there a way that that could be taken down and we could have an issue? Yes, well, then we might be hacked. Let's go and do some investigation and see if anyone actually targets our organization. No, there's no way it could happen. Then fine, don't do it, right? I mean, if you're in a company that sells, I'll tell you what, right? I was at a conference once um, where someone said to me, um, why do we have to worry about this, this information security stuff? And we had this whole long conversation and then they said, but we keep all our files on paper in cabinets and there's no computers. And it was like, okay, well then you don't have to worry about this, right? Why did you make me talk about this? Um, so I think, yeah, ask them, you know, how do we make money? How could that be impacted? Then let's have a conversation. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, the next question is, Mark, what is your worst security advice for organizations? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, oof. I guess, well, the worst. I think you should really avoid believing the hype on information security, right? I was, I was starting to sing, don't believe the hype there in my head. Sorry, because I was listening to it earlier today, actually. Um, I think that if you, if you succumb to the way that the industry has, has turned, right? And again, this is where I sound like an old man, you know, you're in the clouds. But if, if, if you sort of give into it and accept that, oh my God, there's this AI tool that's going to solve all my problems. I'm going to deploy it. It will cost you a few hundred thousand pounds minimum price, as far as I know, to what I'm thinking. Um, it has a really cool GUI, but it doesn't do anything, right? So just, just don't believe the hype, right? Understand again, like what's feasible with technology? What's my risk profile? What should I, you know, that's how you make a decision. So I think that's important. Um, the other worst security advice, I think, would just be, again, to go back to that, like, you know, here's my playbook, here's what you do, go do it, because that's not going to work, right? So don't, again, don't try and do it just because everyone else is doing it and because it worked for you before, right? Um, I think those would be the main ones, I guess. I mean, I could make jokes about Microsoft, right? But I'm not going to do that, because that's the old school now. Um, but yeah, I... I think, yeah, try to, you know, don't believe the hype. So the worst advice would be believe the hype and buy whatever is being recommended by some advertising group. I'm going to be sued out of oblivion. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Uh, next question is, uh, Mark, what do you think about OWASP SAM, the software assurance uh, maturity model? Do you find Anything. it useful for organizations to understand their security posture? Anything from OWASP is fantastic. That was it. That was my answer. That was it. Good. That Good. Was it. That's my uh, I think there's a <laughs> comment on the question on the certification slide that you had. Uh, there is a lot of bad talk about CISSP certification on Twitter these days. What do you think about CISSP or CISP? How some, some people okay. pronounce it? And do you recommend it for your pen testers or just for pen testers in general? I have to give you the truthful answer here because if my pen testers are listening and I give you a, a fake answer, they'll, they'll call me up on it. So um, I would only say I used to have a CISSP, but I let it lapse. 
I would say that I'm, I'm not sure about for profit certifications. I think the CISSP is, is probably a good baseline of, of, of useful information for a security practitioner. I don't think it's particularly useful for penetration testers. I think there are other certifications like the OSTP is a much better certification. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, something like that is actually targeted on like this is what you do for offensive security work. That's much more useful. The CISSP is really good if you want to be kind of like an all-round security bot, right? And if you want to become a CISO at some point, you probably need it um, unless you have really a large chunk of experience. Um, but I don't think it's good for penetration testers. Excellent, thanks. Uh, the next question slash comment is uh, probably about your strategy uh, conversation, one of the slides. Culture is strategy for breakfast. What do you think? I guess maybe. I mean, if we're talking about organizational culture, right, the strategy that you're proposing should kind of take that culture into account, right? So if you have a, if you have a culture that's that's very open and everyone's doing all kinds of, you know, fun, interesting projects, right? Having a strategy that's like, I'm gonna lock down everything and no one can do anything, you're gonna fail, right? Um, by the same token, if you are in an organization like the military, which is very regimented, people follow orders because that's how it has to function, you can probably have a strategy that's pretty rigid in certain points, right? Um, so I don't think it's so much culture each strategy. I think strategy has to take culture into account or it will fail. Again, every organization is a beautiful and unique snowflake. Great, thanks. Um, the next question is, uh, Mark, do you have any specific recommendations where the potential bad guys are actually state-sponsored groups, whether for intellectual property theft or denial of services attacks for DDoS? That's a good question that I'm not going to delve into too much of an answer on, um, which some people will say, ha ha, because he doesn't know anything. Because again, go back to the slide where everyone thinks everyone else sucks. Um, almost certainly there are, there are state sponsored actors, right? I mean, this is, this is beyond debate, right? Um, I think DDoS is kind of a boring thing to do if you're a state sponsored actor, right? Um, it's usually, it's usually done as kind of like, the end phase of something. So I've stolen all this data. Now I'm just gonna crash this out of existence, right? Um, IP theft is a is a big thing, right? And I mean, you know, there's there's various moves being done, certainly by Western countries to, to, to produce some kind of framework on how they deal with IP theft. Um, there was an article that came out two weeks ago on the rise of competitive intelligence, right? Um, Comparative intelligence is, is businesses, you know, trying to get information on each other, which is just an offshoot of nation states trying to get information on each other. So I would say at a high level, there absolutely is nation state sponsored uh, hacking going on. I would probably say it happens. Everyone is doing it right. Um, I'm sure the West attacks the East and the East attacks the West, right? It would be naive to not say that. Um, but yeah, I don't think they do a lot of DDoS stuff. Um, there's been some interesting stuff though, right? I mean, there was the story two years ago, three years ago now, where as far as everyone knows, the Chinese did some BGP hacking. BGP is still this really fun thing that you can play around with. Um, they messed with BGP and rerouted a chunk of the internet for like 45 minutes, right? And then there's all the traffic you could siphon off of that, right? Um, that was clearly a state-sponsored action, right? Um, although it gets kind of murky, right? Because, and, and this is all sort of public stuff, right? So, I mean, if you look at, if you look at Russia and China and yeah, Russia and China, mostly, um, a lot of it is being done by, by groups, right? Who may or may not be state sponsored. China's changed a little bit. There was a book that came out about 15 years ago that went through sort of like what the, the Chinese state-sponsored hacking organizations look like. That's certainly changed right now, um, but it's, it's tricky to tie that back to a, to a nation state. But I think some of it is, is certainly being done by nation states. And I think in the West, 
governments run their, their, their cyber groups, right? So they're not outsourcing it to other people, right? I mean, I'm sure they are in some places, but as far as we know, most of it is done by these, by these state groups, right? Um, so yeah, there is, but hopefully not a lot of DDoS. And if it gets to a DDoS point, I think we're all in trouble because I'm sure all the big players have massive DDoS capability if they want it. Excellent, thanks. And uh, one more question I see in the queue. Uh, Mark, given a second roll of the dice, what would you do differently in your career? I think I would probably, I would read a lot of books about not losing my hair actually, because I think I could probably sell more work if I had more hair. Um, but I think from a professional perspective, I don't know actually, like my, I mean, my career is pretty cool, right? So I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, so I was born in North London, right? So I, I grew up in, a, in Bounds Green and then Tottenham, right? Um, and then I kind of, I, I got this lucky break at CMC Markets. They gave me this job that allowed me to sort of really sort of be at the forefront of, of, of um, internet work as it was back then and information security. And then I was lucky I got hired by KPMG. They shipped me to New York. That was really cool. So now there's this 27 year old kid from Tottenham who's running penetration tests in a KPMG in New York, right? Um, so I think for the most part, I don't think I would change it. I think actually the one thing I probably would change is I would start a company earlier because starting a company is a lot of fun. Um, sometimes it's, it's really not a lot of fun. But I think, yeah, if I could, if I could, I guess, go back, I would have started my company 10 years earlier, right? When information security was, was still in its infancy in many ways, um, kind of like when Foundstone was made, right? For those of you who are old enough to remember that. So some guys at EY, left EY, formed Foundstone, and then Foundstone got bought by McAfee and ISS was made at the same time, right? So ISS was started down in Atlanta and then that got bought by IBM. So I think if I could go back, um, just cause then I'd have more time, right? To do stuff. I mean, I am getting older now. So working really long days is, is getting a bit trying. Um, but yeah, I guess that's what I would do. I would go back and, and start OckhamSec earlier, right? Um, other than that, though, I wouldn't change anything because it's cool. Um, like I said, I'm lucky. I get to work with with a lot of really good people. Um, both, you know, my team at OrkhamSec is fantastic. And I get to work with with, with a lot of good clients who, who do interesting things. And I have just, I just know a lot of cool people in this space. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, yeah, just, yeah, I think my career was cool, actually. I think but not the hair loss part because I can see myself and my head is massive. It's like a bowling ball. Seriously. That's what information security will get you if you're not careful. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Hair loss affects all of us. <laughs> this is longer than, so you're okay. You, you, you still got some. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much for a great talk, Mark. Uh, Thank you. Fantastic 10 lessons. And I think everyone should, uh, watch them some, uh, really, really valuable information there. Um, Right. Okay. I don't think we have any further questions. I think this is it. Um, so um, I'd like to thank everybody and remind everyone how you can follow us and follow our London chapters uh, events. Uh, we have a uh, web page um, on OWASP.org. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter. You can like us on Facebook where we also have OWASP London page. Um, we also exist as a channel on OWASP Slack. If you are not on Slack, uh, you can go to owaspslack.com to join us. There is an um, OWASP Slack invite available also on owasp.org. Um, uh, if you're not a member of Slack, you can join there. We're also on Meetup, which is also OWASP London. And of course, you're watching us live on YouTube right now, where we have our channel, youtube.com slash OWASP London, where all the recordings of all the past talks are being published. Um, we are also on LinkedIn. So if you're on LinkedIn, you can follow OWASP London on LinkedIn as well. I would like to say a big thank you to all our chapter sponsors and would like to remind everyone who wants to sponsor OWASP London, um, they, uh, you, can, you can do by contacting us and uh, you can just follow the contact us link on the um, uh, OWASP London webpage. Um, uh, 
Big reminder, everyone, that we now have the date for our next event, which is going to take place on October the 7th. And we're going to have uh, Andrew Vanderstock, our OWASP Executive Director and the OWASP Top 10 Project Leader. And he's going to tell us everything about the brand new OWASP Top 10. If you haven't seen the brand new OWASP Top 10 draft, it is now available online. Please go to OWASP.org slash top 10 to find out what's changed this year. I would like to thank everybody and remind everyone that the recordings of the talks will be available on OWASP London YouTube channel and all the slides will be shared on OWASP London webpage under past events. Uh, thanks very much to our fantastic speakers tonight and stay safe everyone. We'll be back on October the 7th. Thanks everyone, bye.